Right, okay. Hello, everybody. Hey, Tim. Just changing you back to an attendee. Sorry, the reason there was a small faff there, guys, is because um, basically I can't add people until. Cool, perfect. Yeah, so basically, if you're part of my patron uh, thing, I can't add you for free if, the, if I'm charging for the webinar. So the only way to do it was a bit of a fudge, was to add you as a, a panelist. Don't worry, you, 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 I can't hear, you know, if you're doing other things or, you know, you've got noise, that it won't interrupt. So we've got a few minutes. I'm hopeful uh, that we'll start on time. And um, we've got a small, let me show you what we've got. We've just got a small PowerPoint presentation. Hopefully it won't be death by PowerPoint, uh, but it just helps trying to keep us all on track or keep me on track because I'm, there you go, back to, back to me. I'm not the best at uh, timekeeping with all of this. Talking of which, can you tell me, uh, we probably wait for a few more people uh, to join, but in the meantime, is anyone really stuck for time? Because uh, <laughs> last week it overran, this morning it overran, and I can hack out a whole bunch of time in this because I've got some equations and it depends, and I can run through those super fast if necessary. But just tell me in the chat. Uh, if no, no limits are perfect. Just get all this uh, on here. There we go. Great, 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 great. Thanks, Tim. Everybody well? Good day today. It's quite early in the morning for some of you, isn't it, I guess? It's kind of our, our evening. It's not a bad day today in the UK. So hopefully I'm going to start on time, and if people are late, uh, then then they're late. Mm -hmm. So you can mess around actually with the Q and A thing if you want to. Um, it's just basically at the end we'll do a bit of Q and A, and at the end of each section on that PowerPoint, uh, we will pause and if there's any particularly pressing or something that people are not clear on, we can answer some questions there. So any, any, any intermediate questions, uh, you can stick them in the chat or put them in the Q&A and I'll get to you as soon as I can. All right, we've got about 20 seconds. Look at this, everyone's all racing in. I'm not sure if you can see that actually, but I can. Good, right. Well, I think it's, uh, I think we're on time. And therefore, we'll get going and people who join late can kind of catch up. Hopefully the start isn't too taxing for them. So, for those who didn't hear it a few moments ago, we're gonna use this PowerPoint presentation as a framework just to try and keep things a little bit on time. And obviously it's not gonna be desperately rigid to this. And at the end of each section, that's the broad outline of what we're going to talk about. At the end of each section, 
I'll ask if anyone's got any questions or wants anything clarifying. And if you do, uh, put it in the chat or in the Q and A, and I'll that will flag to me, and I'll try and cover things as best as I can. Right. So introduction. Uh, I can give you. Some of you may be aware of me. You may have even flown with me. I know some in the some in this session have flown with me. But my name's Phil Bennett. You will know me possibly from the YouTube Gyrocopter Flying Club channel, and that's been going quite well. I tried to get that involved or with added impetus over the virus because clearly I wasn't going to be doing much flying, and a lot of people were at home, and also there was quite a lot of common questions either via email or in the questions comments of each video you'll know that a lot of the videos i do are relatively short that's because kind of the nature of people using youtube they don't want to sit you know they don't use it necessarily as a document i know some of us do but particularly i mean i'm 48 and i'm quite happy to watch a youtube film for an hour or so but a lot of other people don't and it just kind of makes things uh, watchable in a YouTube format but of course when you do a four or five minute video there's a limit to what you can get across so this is the idea of these um, webinars as they're called you see in the background uh, a racing car that's me at Le Mans as it happens I used to be a professional driver for most of my younger adult life and then the mind was willing but the body became less so and I then worked in the city in London uh, I was an equity trader I used to work actually for the remnants of Lehman Brothers and uh, flying became a passion of mine which I eventually kind of semi-retired and turned into a job I fly helicopters uh, I've got time in McDonald 500d model the new Cadbury G2, the usual Robinson 44. We also fly fixed wing, and I've got a couple of thousand hours of instruction in gyroplane. And I say all of that not to give it the big one, but just to give you some context as to who I am and whether or not any of what I say has got any relevance to anybody anywhere. And hopefully, in a gyroplane context, I've got a little bit of insight. Certainly, from instructing anyway, I've got all my students to thank. Now, you'll know from my videos in YouTube on the channel, uh, <laughs> I tend to upset some people only because, hello Ken, I'm just gonna stop this and just change you Ken so that you're back to an attendee so that you can, you can relax with your wife. You don't have to think about not making a noise, there you go. Right back to this. There you go. So, um, yes, I use other people's videos to prove a point. And the only reason for that is because it's very good to use real life examples rather than try and recreate something that you think is causing a problem. You may as well actually show the real life problems that real people are having. And bear in mind, these videos, they're only videos that the normally the pilot themselves have uploaded and, and, and actually until I then moan about them they're actually quite proud <laughs> of the of the thing that they've posted up and the, the point is and I try and say this on the channel I don't try and run people over just to be mean I actually try and genuinely to use look it's easier and a lot cheaper uh, both in terms of human capital and machinery to learn from someone else's mistakes. And also the fact that when you recognize someone else's mistake in your own flying, you, you, you kind of in some ways, I know from my own point of view, I, I fly aerobatics occasionally in a fixed wing and I'm fairly, I've got to be honest, I'm fairly hopeless. But sometimes, especially when you're a bit older, it takes to the realization that other people are having the same problems that you are and you kind of feel 
almost a weight lifted or a relief and then you can open up and maybe go oh i didn't realize everyone else was having that problem that's cool or not cool that they're having a problem but at least you know it's not just you right anyway so outline of what we're doing we've got uh, some fundamentals of gyroplane flight so why do they fly uh we're going to talk a little bit about being behind the power curve which is a bit of a pet hate of mine because I don't really like the phrase. Uh, we're going to talk about drag. We're going to talk about the relationship of drag to angle of attack. We're then going to look at the problems with takeoffs, then look at M and ship. Then we're going to look at some takeoff techniques. I'm going to finish off with a little bit of insight into mental capacity. So with all of that said, for now, everyone, I presume, is happy. So we haven't really done very much. So, without further ado, we'll move on to why gyroplanes fly. Now, some of you may be students, some of you may already be qualified pilots in other classes, some of you may even be gyroplane pilots. And at some point, uh, when you've gone to learn to fly a gyroplane, one of the things that I think, especially if you're an existing pilot and you go and learn to fly a gyroplane, and it was certainly true of my own experience, I always felt that a lot of the theory was dumbed down. And there's not a lot of reading material generally. And you kind of left feeling that, especially if you're a bit curious or you like to read about things, you're left sort of wanting in some ways. And for me, I don't think generally, and, and I don't want to tire everybody with the same brush, but if I, if I relate my experience to the UK flying schools, there's not enough conversation or, or content about the explanation about why gyroplanes fly. And they only fly through the same mathematics as every other uh, aircraft with that flies by result of an aerofoil, i.e. it's not a rocket. And we've got this basic equation which I've kind of deconstructed. Lift is equal to the coefficient of lift times half rho v squared s. So what does all of that mean? Well, coefficient of lift is just a function of the angle of attack and the shape of the aerofoil. So if you imagine you've got either a big fat aerofoil profile section or a real thin one and how you present that to the relative wind. Half rho, well that's air density and for our purposes in a gyroplane that doesn't really change and to be fair the aerofoil shape it might change in a nuanced way between manufacturers but by and large if you've got a Magni or if you've got an Autogyro or a Benson or whatever your rotor isn't going to change, certainly not during the flight. V squared is velocity squared, and we'll come on to that because rotary wing velocity is a combination of airspeed, as you would see on the nose, and represented to the pilot via the airspeed indicator, and also rotational velocity of the rotor. And then the wing surface area, S, that again, it's just the size of the wing. But again, for our purposes, we're not in a very complex multi sort of military, multi sort of role aircraft. That doesn't change for our purposes. So to actual pilots, and bear in mind, this is a pilot seminar, it's not an aerodynamic uh, seminar. The things that we can influence as pilots are effectively the angle of attack and speed. And, and that's it, actually. So we're going flying by how we present our rotor to the air and how fast we fly through it. So I did say, and I'll move this on quite quickly, that our velocity part of the, comp of the equation, and I've ripped this slide off of a helicopter um, instructional presentation, They've represented the lift equation slightly differently, but it's the same thing. They just put the order in a different, uh, they've just ordered it differently. So airspeed on the nose as represented 
on the airspeed indicator, which would be it actually if we we're in a fixed wing. But because we've got a rotary wing, we've obviously got rotational velocity of the rotor. Now, we can calculate the speed that each part of our rotor experiences during its rotation by a simple equation that you probably used from the time you were at junior school, which is the circumference of a circle, because after all, uh, a rotor uh, you know, draws a circle, and it's uh, pi d, or two pi r, as, uh, or sorry, two, sorry, pi uh, two, two times the radius squared. But of course, we'll just use the diameter. And most factory built gyroplanes have got a rotor diameter of 28 feet. Now, if you do pi d, you get a circumference of around 88 feet. So if one, if the rotor RPM is one revolution a minute, the tip of the rotor travels 88 feet in that minute. So if we then multiply that out to an hour, we get 5,280 feet in an hour or a mile per hour. So one revolution per, one revolution per minute gives us one miles an hour at the tip. So you can imagine they've probably worked that out. And it means that when you pre-rotate to 200, 220, which should be a reasonably familiar speed to most of you, it means that the tip speed is somewhere between 200 and 220 miles an hour. So when you're on the runway, going nowhere with a flat calm day, you've effectively got 220 miles an hour of velocity over the tip of the rotor. Of course, that velocity decreases as you get towards the root of the rotor blades, but nevertheless, that's a good start of a 10. And we get airborne through a combination of the airspeed that we see and can read on the airspeed indicator, an angle of attack, which for us, sorry, speed you can read on the airspeed indicator and rotor RPM, and then angle of attack. And for our purposes as pilots, a rough indication of angle of attack is our stick position. Now, if you have hung around gyroplane instructors, you've probably heard the term being behind the power curve. I don't like that term. I think it dumbs things down. Why do I think it dumbs it down? Well, because for me, that isn't a power curve. That just represents a line on a graph showing Actually, it's not even power. This, sorry, just to qualify what this is, this, this entire uh, picture is something that was presented by our own UK CAA, Civil Aviation Authority, because in 2011, there were a lot of takeoff accidents and one of the issues was what they termed flight behind the power curve. But you can see, I'm sorry, I've just clicked on the wrong thing. You can see that the graph is, well, it's fairly inaccurate. And when you ask people that think they understand what this graph shows, what it doesn't show is when they told you that you can fly behind the power curve, well, then you say, well, where, where are all these blue, uh, points on the graph, am I ever behind that red line? And the answer is you never are. And for me, especially coming from an automotive background for many years, that is what I would say is a power curve where our X axis is engine speed and our Y axis is engine power and the bottom is a torque curve. So, much better to explain. So when people talk about flight behind the power curve, what they actually mean is flying behind the drag curve. And I think it's useful 
to explain to your students, or in my case, not my students, but people who are perhaps interested to either learn something or validate their view or whatever, to try and explain what's really going on. So if we take drag, and I don't want to dumb all of this down or, or teach you how to suck eggs, but you've effectively got three drags. You've got parasitic drag, which as you can read possibly, is effectively the drag that's caused by all of the parts of the gyrocopter X the rotor. So that's the body, the windscreen, the mast, uh, the tailplane, the undercarriage and so on. And that's just the drag that occurs through pushing this mass through the air. And parasitic drag increases with airspeed. You've also got something called profile drag, which is basically the drag of the rotor itself passing through the air. Obviously, we've just talked about the fact that the rotor, even at pre-rotational speeds, at the tip is traveling at 200, 220 miles an hour, and sticking that rotor through the air creates a drag. It doesn't actually change, profile drag doesn't change particularly with angle of attack, uh, but it does increase like parasitic drag does with airspeed. The final drag is induced drag. And induced drag is simply the drag created as a result of producing lift with a finite aerofoil. And I say finite because if you could create a, an aerofoil that went to infinity, you would not get induced drag because the airflow would always be attached to the aerofoil and it wouldn't spill off the tip. So if you, actually there's a great film on YouTube, it's a series, that was done by, I think it was Professor Boozman, who was, a, he was actually an, a, a Nazi that came to America as part of Operation Paperclip. And I think he worked ultimately at Convair and he did a whole series on aerodynamics in the 1950s, where he was televised. And it's a great series, it's, still, it's available on YouTube and he's got a lot of uh, interesting aerodynamic uh, illustrations through uh, smoke chambers. And when you look at induced drag, you can see it's basically all the tip vortices. So if you imagine the wing and the, the, the wing ends here, all of, the, all of those spirally uh, turbulent flow that you see is induced, is, you're seeing induced drag in, in being produced basically. So if we were to graph what we've just talked about, we would see this, where parasitic drag, i.e. the drag, created by dragging your body through the air increases with forward speed. Profile drag, the rotor also ticks up with forward speed, whereas induced drag decreases with forward speed. Why? Because as you get towards the higher speed range, if you go back to that equation, you'll see that let me just take you back to the equation that we started to, and I don't want to oversimplify it, but I just want to clarify. We said we were only affecting velocity squared and angle of attack. Well, if velocity is squaring, that may, makes the curve exponent, ex, exponential. And that means that we can take away angle of attack with the unequal measure if we're going to maintain the same lift force and we would maintain the same lift force if we were going to stay straight and level because of course the only reason to produce lift is to oppose weight and on the basis that apart from a bit of fuel load that we may lose during our flight weight broadly is staying the same so total drag is then the sum of all of our other drags and you can see it produces this nice red curve 
You could also express that red curve in a different way. And if you took the bottom of our curve, that would be the minimum drag, but it's also conveniently because that is the point where drag is its minimum. It also means, broadly speaking, that we could complicate this by talking about the effect of thrust from the prop versus airspeed, but we won't. So in simple terms, it's also the minimum power for level flight, which means if we move to the right and we go faster, we need to add power to go faster because we've got more drag from the parasitic side. Whereas if we go to the left of our minimum power level, I've seen your hand up, Charles, I'll pick you up in a minute. If we go to the left, we need increased power for decreasing airspeed. Why? Because we're pulling more angle of attack and we're gaining more induced drag. Let me just see what, uh, Charles, tell me in the chat here, let me just explain where, uh, here, if you can see here, are you okay, Charles, or it was a mistake? While you, while you let me know, I'll just carry on. So, I know, ah, <laughs> cool, okay, sorry, no problem. So this graph is just showing the relationship of angle of attack, lift and drag. So here you can see that at 20 degrees angle of attack, we get to the point of maximum lift. But you can see that because of all that induced drag, we've got an enormous amount of drag. And then at the other end, you can see that the point that where we get the most lift for the least drag is around six degrees angle of attack, which is this lift drag curve here. So the only thing that may confuse slightly is the fact that we go back to this graph, 20 degrees angle of attack doesn't seem very much for a gyroplane, does it? Because you might think, if you think in fixed wing terms, 20 degrees angle of attack is something like, I'm trying to get perpendicular to my camera, but it's about that. It's not very, it's not very much. And then you think, well, actually, when I uh, pre-rotate, you know, the disc is back at almost, I don't know, 45, 50, 60 degrees even, maybe even more in some uh, aircraft. So what's going on? Well, of course, the angle of attack is always to relative airflow. And what that means is, because we've got this rotational velocity, because of our rotor, our angle of attack and the relative wind to our aerofoil or our rotor is a combination of air that we see on the nose of the aircraft and the rotational velocity of the rotor. And the advancing blade flaps up and effectively decreases the angle of attack on that rotor. And then the retreating blade, that flaps down and increases the angle of attack. And when we're stationary pre-rotating and we pull the stick all the way back, it doesn't create a huge problem either in terms of the ability to flap out any differences of uh, velocities with advancing and retreating blades because the majority of that is created via the rotational velocity of the rotor itself. And by the same token, the angle of attack isn't actually 40, 50, 60 degrees. It's probably down towards, you know, the 20, 22 degrees, You're probably getting on for almost stalled actually when it's fully, fully back. But it isn't quite as extreme as you might think. Okay, 
Everybody happy with that or any questions? No, good. Okay, I'll, I'll rattle on. So what's the big danger? Well, basically, the reason that I'm talking about takeoffs is slightly related to the first webinar I did last week, which was about accidents. And that's because 75%, certainly in the UK, and I think it's a similar picture in the States, but about <clears throat> three quarters of all accidents are just normal takeoffs and landings. And it's slightly skewed to the takeoff side than it is the landing side. And it's quite incredible. <coughs> Excuse me. Picture on the left, that's an MT Sport in Texas, ended in the woods. That was a poorly judged takeoff, having landed out because the iPad didn't work and he got lost. And I chuckle. I chuckle because both him and his wife walked away on relatively unscathed. But I chuckle because when I, if you read NTSB reports, you can actually see the docket, where, which is the pilot's own description of what happened. And when he explains his remedy for landing in a field effectively to try and get his iPad to work, his remedy wasn't to get a paper chart out and carry on a planned route. His remedy was just to get his iPhone out, give that to the wife, and then she was going to follow the, the same app, but on the phone, not on the iPad, and talk to him on the radio. And then in the takeoff, well, that's the result. It was obviously misjudged. The one on the right here, this Cavalon, that's the 915 Cavalon that crashed with the guy that had only previously flown the 912 Cavalon. And this was the result of his first attempt. Uh, just to prove it's not all the US, though, this red Calidus crashed in the UK, how long ago? Not that long ago, a couple of three years ago. That was what we know as a blade flap. Uh, I'll talk about that in a short while. And the bottom picture with an MT, that's actually an MT-03, one of the first kind of factory built gyros. That was crashed into the road, that's just after takeoff. And that was with a student and an instructor on board. The, hmm, not really sure what happened there. It was either flown overweight and the, and the initial part of the takeoff got behind the drag curve or the power curve, whichever you prefer. And the instructor didn't pick it up early enough or certainly not enough to remedy it. Or, it was flown overweight, and MTO3s used to only have a 450 kilo weight limit, so that was always possible, especially with full fuel and a couple of big lads on board. And they tended to get flown overweight often because actually flying overweight for the most part didn't damage anything, it was just you know a big risk. Or they say they had an engine problem, but then they all say that, don't they? and then you can't ever find the engine problem that they say they have. Anyway, that was the result, and that was all done and dusted. That wrote that aircraft off. Okay, so what are we trying to achieve? <clears throat> I know that seems a little bit simplistic, and perhaps in some ways uh, almost sounds as if I'm taking the mickey, <clears throat> but the reason I say it, is that for years, I don't think in a single seat world, so this is going back to 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, even into the 90s, don't really think single seater pilots had a number in their head about how far they actually needed to take off. I think, especially because a lot of them didn't have great pre rotators. There was a whole period of time, especially in the early part of the takeoff roll, where they were trying to build rotor RPM, which was not really that tangible. You know, you couldn't quantify it well enough to give a repetitive, uh, accurately repetitive takeoff process in terms of saying it's going to take 500 meters or whatever. And so they didn't really bother 
they just had a good awareness of how long they needed to stop and they kind of knock it off. If it wasn't working out well, they just knock it off early and bring it to a halt and try again. Of course, now we've got more standardized, for want of a better word, aircraft, and certainly this phenomenon, if it, for, for want of a better word, is definitely the trend in the US where you've got Magni and Autogyro product uh, where they're all the same and a pilot operating handbook which gives a number. I think we now need to start thinking about takeoffs as something that defines the distance required to, to, to clear 50 feet. So this graphic again comes from the UK CAA and what it shows is that this area here before the blue line is just the ground roll where everything's on the deck. Then this sort of uh, initial part of the takeoff would be traditionally what everybody would call the wheel balancing part. And then where the red gyrocopter is would be what everyone would know as the airspeed build up phase. And then finally we would climb, climb away and you normally climb away at VY or best rate of climb, which is broadly for most Magni and Autogyro products. It's about 60 miles an hour thereabout. Okay, so what goes wrong? Well, there's quite a lot that goes wrong and I'm gonna look at these in more detail. So I'm just gonna rattle through the headings. We can over rotate which is broadly what the Cavalon 915 did. We can suffer a blade flap, which is what the red Calidus did in England. Climb out behind the drag curve, which I think is what happened to our instructor and his students in the MT-03. You could run out of runway, uh, which is what the guy in Texas did and collected the trees. You can struggle with crosswinds. You can also lose your control, although, as I've said, normally loss of your control on takeoff is correlated with another problem. That's just the end result. Or you could have engine failure. Now, I know with Rotax 9 series engines, so 912, 914, and now 915, that's not as common as it used to be with old two strokes or Subaru powered RF 2000s, for example. And we tend to ignore failures, mechanical failures in 2020 because they don't, they don't often happen. Although clearly that could be something that goes wrong. And when we go back to our graphic of what we're trying to achieve, if we're gonna be mindful of the fact that there could be a potential failure, trying to get airborne or trying to get as high as possible as early as possible is a good thing because if the engine does fail, we can do something when we're broadly in a gyroplane. The, the, the period which is really dangerous is the beginning of the climb to around 150 feet. I think if there's an engine failure, which stops the engine totally dead, in that region, certainly above 50 feet and before probably 150, 200, I think for a new pilot, that probably kills him because I don't think by the time you've cognizantly appreciated you've got an engine problem, and then reacted and done something about it positively, i.e. you've got to get the nose down to keep airspeed, I think the airspeed's decay, and then you just pancake in with the obvious consequence. So, so there are, there, those are our, that's our list of typical problems. So, over-rotation. Those of you who watch my channel regularly, well, no, I've covered this element quite a lot, actually. And it's because it's very much underappreciated. 
And the reason it's underappreciated is the fact that the instructor community don't really like to highlight the fact greatly because it's broadly caused by the desire to find a wheel balance. And certainly when you're a student, that your early attempts at trying to maintain this wheel balance attitude or the correct nose attitude, at times you'll have over rotated and probably the instructor has taken the aircraft off you to correct that. Of course, when you become a new pilot, because typically, especially in the UK, our winters are not very kind to aviation, it tends to mean that from around late October, early November, nothing happens until March. So over that winter time, you're not particularly keeping your skills up to date, and then you get a bit rusty. And so when you start over again, you then scare yourself over rotating. It's more prevalent with cranked keel types, i.e. auto gyro. And what I mean by cranked keel is you can see on this calidus and you can see how the tailplane is mounted quite high on this uh, keel tube. Magni keel would be just dead straight. Uh, so it is more prevalent, it is more, um, you see it more often with autogyro types for that reason, because obviously you can, you can gain a, a much greater pitch attitude with that design. But because the rotor has got so much control authority, if you persist with back stick, even with the straight keel, uh, you will over rotate. So it's driven by a desire to wheel balance, as I said, but also you can, as well as the fact that you could just have a poor technique or a good technique that is, is just kind of, that your skills have decayed over time. It's also possible that if you're trying to get a wheel balance and you're good at wheel balancing, you can obviously get distracted. Obviously, if you fly a new aircraft like the guy, like our Cavalon 915 pilot did, he was quite experienced, I think, in Cavalon, but he hadn't really flown a 915 and just got caught out. Also, weight and balance has a big effect, and the weight of the total weight. And why, I'm, why I say that is that where you see it as a, an instructor pilot is where students go solo and now you take yourself out of the aircraft and I'm about 80, 85 kilos I suppose with my flying gear on. When you take that amount of mass out of the aircraft as a percentage of the whole it's quite enormous and then everything happens so much quicker. The aircraft accelerates faster, it reacts uh, more quickly and they tend to over rotate at that stage or that is the risk. The consequence of over rotation is that you get a very low unstick speed. Why? Well because the angle of attack, <laughs> yeah especially in a 915 Chris example, so you get a very low unstick speed. Why? Because when you over rotate, not, if you imagine our angle of attack is kind of multiplied by the virtue of the fact that initially, I'm trying to get this the right way around on the screen because it reverses things a bit off. So this is, my, this is the body of my gyroplane and this is my rotor. And the rotor's all the way back as I'm on the ground roll. Now obviously as I, as I then go into a wheel balance, because the rotor is obviously connected to the body, unless I do something with the stick to change the angle of my rotor disc, that just follows the body and gets even bigger. So at some point, you find that some guys get airborne, they just about unstick, but they've got an enormous amount of drag, A, from the rotor, but also it has a big effect in your when you get unstuck slow. Why does it have a big effect in your? Well, it's because if we go back to our smashed up calidus as an example, there's the propeller. That propeller creates a helix of air that comes off the prop. And at some point, that helix of air smashes into the tailplane. Now, when you're very slow, 
if you imagine the helix of air is like a spring and as you get slow that spring effectively compresses and as you get faster it gets stretched out that helix when it's slow bashes into this tailplane at a, at a more acute angle of attack than it does when you're when you've got some speed and for that reason when you get that kind of very low speed unstick the aircraft first of all has got no acceleration but because it's slow the the effect of that prop uh, helix batters into the tailplane and tends to yaw the aircraft left uh, with a rotax motor and then now you're showing more of the fuselage side to the airflow which gets you even more draggy and tends to be then that you sink back down onto the runway because the lift that you had that could keep you in the air when you were clean now can't keep you airborne and you sink back down onto the runway only now you're not aligned with the wheels to the direction of travel and you can dig in and roll of course the other thing when you're very nose high you get poor vision and the steep deck angle and a low speed climb out that is all of the ingredients uh, for climbing out behind the drag curve and that in itself has got consequences in fact all of these as i say here the loss of control is possible in all of those so the other consequence of all of this even if you've managed to avoid the ultimate consequences is that if we relate back to this graphic if you're over controlling the distraction on trying to correct it in and of itself starts to eat up uh, more runway because clearly you're not necessarily or certainly you don't feel that you're in complete control and you're trying to sort it out and that is very distractional because your attention now is purely on <coughs> excuse me purely on sorting out the problem and not in clearing the thing at 50 feet at the end of the runway so cavil on not as i said is typical of over rotation now i'm not entirely sure i'm just going to bring something up for those who may or may not know what i mean by cavil on not and at least we'll all be on the same page and then i'll move on so cavil on nod let me just get this teed up and then we'll uh, get into it right there we go stop sharing this so that's back to me share my video here okay so what do I mean by cavil on nod? Well, what I mean by cavil on nod is this nose, it's just kind of like a rocking horse, really. It looks very, it looks horrible. And you can see here, before, before we play the whole of this, this guy, sorry, we'll just back it up. So this guy in the white cavil on, uh, there's two clips of him. They're at the same runway, and this actually perfectly, absolutely perfectly illustrates just how the process of nodding your way down the runway eats the runway, because you'll see on the first pass, he does have some nodding going on, but he manages to get off the deck uh, relatively, or well, sooner than the other time. And you'll see just how much further the second pass takes so here we go there's pass one and he's basically kind of almost had a lucky bounce and we're off the deck and you'll see the windsock there look it's not as if we've got it's not blowing a gale so it's not it's not really wind related but now here's the second clip and you can just see how oh now we're over the other side of this intersection and oh, we just keep, we hadn't even taken off then, and we didn't even look like we were going to. There's another clip of a couple of American pilots. Uh, here we are. Now, this is 
this had the potential to get very ugly indeed actually this is ter this is a terrible terrible takeoff um here we go we're going to pre-rotate i'll talk you through a little bit what's happening i don't know if anybody knows this guy but if you do he really does need to go and get a bit of time with an instructor i mean i don't think he's an instructor but um one of the problems with Cavalon is it's really affected, especially if you have a lot of fuel, because the fuel, when you rotate, sloshes quite far back, and the amount of forward stick you need to get airborne cleanly is enormous. So look at this, stick's all the way back, and we're off on the ground roll. He has actually unloaded the stick, but can you just see that we're up and down, up and down, up and down, and then finally, we managed to get airborne, and I think this passenger is wondering whether he's going to make it back home tonight. So, and again, I'm sharing these things with you, not to, if, if that guy is a friend of yours, it's not to be rude to him. You don't know what you don't know. And, uh, you know, he's maybe an early, early forays into gyroplane flight but the point is these are real problems they're not me writing this powerpoint presentation in a bunch of words and theorizing there's the real problem now the thing is is that that pilot has got a license so at some point he's gone through a, a training program of some description and passed a flight test but now he's in a Cavalon. I don't know whether he did his test in a Cavalon, and he's got problems. And at some point, th that goes that goes wrong, fr frankly. Okay, hang on. Here we go. Question in the chat. Can I talk you through that one again? What the the Cavalon nod in the chat, Chris? That let me know. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, shall I do the video? Shall I put it back on the video again? Hang on. Let me just. Let me go back to Cavalon Mod. Right. So, in cockpit, obviously it's difficult really to see the movement of the aircraft. But I show you those videos because you get the, out, the outside and the inside. So, this is what that American gyro. Uh, that American Cavalon would have looked like from the outside, except probably a little bit more extreme. And what happens is, so we're, we're sat on the runway, we finish pre-rotating, we release the pre-rotator, and the stick comes all the way back. So now we're running down the runway with the stick all the way back, and the rotor RPM is building. And if we go back to our lift equation, at some point, rotor RPM has built up enough, and we've got good velocity at the tip of the rotor. And because we're accelerating in the ground roll, we've now got some airspeed on the nose. At some point, those two, the combination of those two, gives us enough lift to get off the deck. But because we've still got the stick back, typically with some of these guys, they're a little bit behind the curve, and they've kept the stick back, then the nose has risen. And the reason that it nods is actually because what they do is they try and control that nodding with stick input. And because they're trying to control it with stick input, they, they tend to be, what I guess you could say is, you know, one, one phase out. You know, they're just out, out of phase. So as the, the gyroplane nose is coming up, they're trying to go forward stick. But at that point, the drag from the rotor and the body has already an you know that's already going to happen anyway so now you're just kind of forcing the thing up and down with the stick so if you look at if you look at this this was not this is actually one in germany so it's a universal thing it's an international problem so here's a german gyroplane a german cavalon doing it there you go so he's kept the stick back oh no this can't geez put the stick forward but it's coming down anyway Cut, put it back and then it goes back up same with the guy in the UK, only this is even, second one in particular is even more comical. And you can see that yaw and roll, particularly there, you, you can see it just, it's so horrible. 
And of course, the reason it sinks back down there is because now it's got a little bit more drag and we're back down. This was, I think, I think this was a German Cavalon as well, actually. This isn't quite as bad in pitch, <clears throat> but it shows how you start one, his distraction trying to control the aircraft in pitch has meant that he's lost the center line and he's drifted over to the left. And it's all this interconnectivity of, you know, the, the, because these guys are rel clearly, in my opinion, I think these are relatively new guys. And as a result of all of this, they don't have massive mental capacity to deal with multiple issues. And as a result, in trying to focus on one particular element, they tend to drop the ball or, you know, not be completely on the ball, should I say, somewhere else. So there you go. Happy with that? Good, right. Back to my pal. Here we go. Right, so. So that's the situation. So the other problem that we can have, apart from over rotation, is we can have blade flat. Now, blade flap we saw in the Calidus, the red Calidus, and happily we can talk about the problems of that. So let me find the actual accident report for that Calidus and I'll share that with you. Typically, blade flap is, is not because you've outrun the rotor necessarily because you've got a 915 engine for say, it's typically because you've allowed the rotor RPMs to decay and then you've outrun the decaying rotor RPM rather than you've kept good attention on rotor RPM but your aircraft has got so much thrust, you've outrun it. It only happens because you allow the rotor RPMs to decay. And that used to be a big issue. And it was a real, um, back to me, because I'm going to share you a different screen. It was a real frustration for me. And in fact, three years ago, I wrote a paper that I submitted to some people that were influential in UK gyroplanes and including the CAA to complain about this. Because one of the issues is, when you used to mention to certainly seasoned UK gyroplane instructors and said people should monitor their rotor RPM. They would be, they'd throw their arms up and say, well, the rotor's in auto rotation and, it, and the rotor RPMs sort themselves out if you use the right technique. The problem with that is by definition that we're having all these takeoff accidents, some people are not employing the right technique. So, We've got a choice, haven't we? We can either just keep saying, well, if you just did the right thing, you'd be okay. Or we could probably look at why they're having a problem and try and give them some tools to help themselves. Now, bearing in mind, all these relatively new gyroplanes, and in fact, some of the old ones, have all got rotor RPM gauges. That's not a new phenomenon. And the data from those gauges is reasonably reliable. Uh, and, you know, if you come from a background of helicopter or fixed wing, mo monitoring one or two instruments during the takeoff roll is, is hardly anything particularly taxing. So why, why not do it? And this accident report gives you the reason why that is important. So this guy, he was at RAF Scampton, which is um, an RAF base in Lincolnshire. And this guy used to be an ex-RAF pilot and he'd been attending a family's day. Now, family's day is where the RAF put on a little display, air display for friends and family of the people who work at RAF Scampton in this case. And this guy was attending and he flew in there with his own gyroplane. He's got a lot of hours, he's nearly got 12,000 hours and a lot of those would be military hours. And, and I highlight that because 
Sometimes you get these airline pilots that just take off from London Heathrow and then land in Los Angeles. And they've only done one takeoff and one landing, but they've got 12 hours in the logbook. Clearly, someone who's flown the military with 12,000 hours has probably done a lot of takeoffs and landings, and therefore those are quality hours. He hasn't got a massive amount of hours on a gyroplane, but I'd say he's got enough. And certainly, recency look, he's got 20 hours in the last 90 days and five in the last 28. So, you know, he, he, he wasn't massively rusty. But the key thing is, look, he pre-rotated and uh, released the brakes and the gyroplane accelerated quickly. And then at 40 to 50 miles an hour, he said that the machine pitched up rapidly and rolled onto its left side. Now, happily, there was, a, there was a GoPro in the cockpit. So what he thought happened and what he saw happened didn't, didn't actually match because the pilot, after the accident, both the pilot and his experienced passenger recalled that the control stick was positioned fully back in the normal manner before the takeoff run commenced. However, a video recording of the takeoff suggested that the gyroplane was pre-rotated normally. It was, a, and then it goes on to say, it was apparent, it was apparent that the rotor did not tilt back until immediately prior to the gyroplane pitching nose up. So what's happened is he's pre-rotated and he's left the stick here forward. He's gone off down the runway during his ground roll and because the rotor is very flat, it accelerates quickly because there's no rotor drag. And then at some point, con consciously or unconsciously, he's brought the stick back. And at that point, we've rapidly pitched nose up and we've rolled to the left. Well, why does it do that? Well, it pitches nose up because you've introduced an angle of attack and you've tried to gain some lift. And that's what the aerofoils tried to do for you. But the reason it's rolled to the left and you've ended up with this mess that you can see here is because if we go back to go back to the PowerPoint, it's because if we go back to what happens here, the symmetry of lift, <clears throat> what will have happened is during the ground roll with the blades flat, rotor RPM will have decayed. And what that means is, is at some point, the airspeed on the nose via the acceleration on the ground gets to be a bigger percentage of the total velocity and the rotor cannot flap enough to equalize the lift left and right because it hits the teeter stop and when it hits the teeter stop two things happen the first is we don't have uh, an effective method of equalizing the lift because one side is constrained but actually by virtue of the fact that the other is connected they're both constrained but in the instant, I suppose with bending motions and so on, it basically tries to roll left. It rolls to the uh, retreating blade. And at the same time, because that aerofoil or probably the hub bar in this case would have hit the teeter stop, it transfers the force down into the control stick and rapidly smashes it out of your hand. That you'd struggle to hold on to that. And so you've at that point you've departed from, well, I suppose you've lost control, departed from control flight if you ever got airborne in the first place, if only for a while, and then the thing smashed itself up. But the key to it is, sorry, I'm just gonna go back to it just to, just to show you one thing. The key to it is, you'll notice that the pilot can clearly remember pre-rotating to 200, but he's got no idea, and you could read if you you, you could pull this uh, pull this report up yourself. Uh, a lot of it goes on actually to talk about the reason that report's quite long is because it rolled onto its side, and the AAIB were concerned about egress from uh, um, an aircraft on its roof because of the way that the canopy opened. But the point that I was trying to make 
is at no point during the report does the pilot report any rotor RPMs beyond the pre-rotation RPM. And my view is, had he been monitoring ro rotor RPM during the ground roll, uh, that would be impossible to happen. Well, or, or rather, it wouldn't be impossible to happen, but you'd have to be a little bit silly in the sense that you would see the situation getting worse for you and you would have not done anything about it. So why have rotor RPMs decayed? Well, as we just said, uh, you've either got a delay in bringing the stick back or you haven't brought the stick back at all. Uh, why wouldn't you bring the stick back? Well, probably you've got distracted with other things or you've just not done that movement often enough, i.e. you're not, you don't have enough experience. Uh, not seeing the rotor RPM increase prior to relaxing any backstick is obviously another issue. The physical limitation, and that tends to be these days, uh, someone's tummy. And uh, it's not necessarily your own tummy, it can be a passenger. But, you know, if you've got somebody in the aircraft that's a bit portly, uh, then you won't be able to bring the stick back. And don't forget, especially with these four point harnesses, you know, you've got the central sort of locating belt, which is, you know, about half an inch to an inch thick. And that on top of the tummy can also be a problem. Also, people sometimes put bags on seats that can snag. Also, rotor RPMs decay if you're in light winds, as in, because there's no wind on the nose immediately, you bring the stick back, there's nothing to accelerate the rotor other than your own generated airspeed by um, releasing the wheel brake and getting going. And some people are very slow to get going uh, during the takeoff. Also, you could leave the rotor brake on. That can be an issue with Magni because the rotor brake is actually down by your calf. And there is a, um, a light on the dashboard that's an alarm to tell you that the rotor brake is on. But depending on how you've got that switch adjusted, depends whether it's fully off or just on a little bit, and that can bring the rotor RPMs down. And also Magnis are also, they don't, I wouldn't say they struggle, but they, they are prone to rotor RPMs decaying faster than an auto gyro, simply because the, the rotor is a lot heavier. And as soon as you take away the mechanical pre-rotator, especially with, you know, big angle of attack, so there's a lot of now drag. Uh, it just brings the whole thing down uh, faster than, than auto gyros, in, in my experience. Okay, any questions in the meantime? No? Good, okay. So, the other problem I said was that you could climb out behind the drag curve. Well, why does that happen? Well, it's typically because you failed to monitor airspeed. Uh, and again, it's probably an instructor teaching failure. But also, as I said, it's kind of co that coexists by this over rotation. If you started over rotating initially, and then you just kind of lived with it because now you're off the deck, maybe not for the whole climb, but for certainly the early part, you might well be behind the drag curve. The other problem, which I can see this being bigger in the future is because there seems to be an increase in trend with takeoffs of less than 100% power, as in the instructors and the examiners are not impressing upon the students to use 100% power. Now, I don't mean 100% power from the time you release the brakes for the ground roll, but I mean at some point during the ground roll, in my opinion, you should always be on 100% power before you commence the climb out at VY. Anything other than that seems, well, it seems crazy to me. Uh, you can also run out of runway. Why would you run out of runway? Well, typically it's because you've not planned your flight very well and you're somewhere which, where the dimensions of the runway are just too small. But also, subtly, you can get caught out because you're either taking off downwind or you're overweight, or the temperature of the day and the density altitude is not favorable. 
Uh, the surface of the runway obviously could degrade or could be degraded from your usual airfield. And again, back to this, you know, not using 100% throttle and the wheel balancing errors that I mentioned earlier. And that is probably, those two latter points are probably in the future going to be, again, more common uh, issues. Certainly the, the throttle. I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely staggered that that's now what is the default teaching is that 100% throttle for takeoff is, is kind of seen as optional. But there you go. Crosswinds tend not to be massively problematic, actually. If, if, they, if they are, it tends to be a lack of practice. What tends to happen when you get a student or a pilot that comes to you for some guidance around crosswind, it's normally because they haven't, they haven't really flown very much, um, certainly recently, and they're just a little bit out of practice. Because the good thing with a gyroplane is because you've got that rotor, which is a 28 foot diameter disc, you've got huge control authority and it doesn't take very much stick input to overcome quite powerful crosswinds in truth. Engine failure, well, that goes back to my point I was making about the need to use 100% throttle because in some ways the two things are interrelated because realistically any factor, and certainly fixed wing pilots would absolutely be all over this. Any factor which increases the length of the takeoff run it erodes safety because you've either got a situation where if you have a problem and you need to stop, well, now you've got less runway ahead in which to stop to affect an emergency, uh, emergency stop. Or if you've unstuck when the problem happens, now you're just closer to something that you might be able to hit. Whereas if you got on the throttle and got on with it sooner, well, now you've got at least some, uh, you've got more height basically, and therefore you may be able to do something more constructive than crash into that obstacle. Okay, now I just want to talk about airmanship because I also think that there is an increasing, it's going to change screens to give another leaflet, which I think is useful. Um, there we go. When people teach takeoff, very often they spend more time teaching airmanship than they do the takeoff technique itself. And for me, I don't understand that. Well, as in, look, clearly there are elements during the takeoff that are points of airmanship. Like, for example, when you're at the hold and you're about to line up onto the axial runway, you don't, you don't pull out onto somebody on final. I mean, that's a point of airmanship. Likewise, if you're at the hold and you need permission to line up, then you wait for permission to line up. But that isn't really teaching takeoffs, as in it's not about the technique. And I think, again, and this is definitely, in my opinion, a big problem with the US uh, system, because in the main, a lot of US pilots are going through pilot training for a gyroplane license in barely double digit hours. You know, they're getting thrown through the process very quickly. And I read something online recently, the guy who I believe is the chief instructor at Autogyro USA, a guy called, I think his name is Bob Schneider. Uh, he talks about the average time for people to get a license is 10 hours. Well, 10 hours, there's no way, there's no way that you can spend enough time with the students in 10 hours to cover everything that you need to, to, to cover. And 
yeah, you might get through that process and, and have a ticket to go and fly, but unless you're very disciplined and you're going to do a lot of self-study and get on top of these kind of topics, I'm not going to run through this leaflet. I'm just using the leaflet because it gives you a great sense of what's required as a pilot. These things are, are needed to be almost ingrained. You know, you need to be familiar with how to work the radio. You need to be familiar with what the likely things you're going to be asked on the radio and how to respond. And you need to be familiar with the performance of your aircraft, the, the, the layout of your cockpit, you know, where is the oil pressure gauge? Oh, it's there. Where is the rotor gauge? Oh, it's there. I used to have students that sometimes, <laughs> I, sh I shouldn't laugh, but I can now in, it, upon reflection. The original auto gyro MT-03 that I used to instruct on had the rotor RPM gauge and the engine RPM gauge uh, very close to each other. And very often the students would look at rotor RPM gauge and of course initially the rotor RPM gauge is reading zero because rotors are not going anywhere and they think that the engine wasn't running because they were they just got confused and these are the kind of things that you, when you experience you don't necessarily unless you unless you experience that issue with the students of your own you don't necessarily think that that can be a problem but it is a problem and I don't want to over egg this particular pudding, but I do say points of airmanship, that shouldn't be a conversation really that is about whether or not we can take off. These things should be a given. You know, if you're, if you're at a point where you're doing the takeoff, then you should be able to nail most of the points on that list without being prompted or spoon fed uh, by an instructor. And as I said to you, if we go back to the presentation uh, here, if you go back to this running out of runway uh, malarkey, oh, Michael, one second, I'll just change you a wee bit. Sorry, Michael, you've uh, missed me a wee bit. I'm just gonna, just gonna change you. There you go. Perfect. Yes. Going back to uh, going back to this, where people run out of runway. Clearly, if you run out of runway, well, that's an airmanship. You know, that's poor planning. You know, the guy in Texas that put that MT Sport into the woods, and probably his wife's never going to fly with him ever again. Well, that was all down to airmanship. Completely. Same with the guy in the Cavalon that smashed his 915 Cavalon off on the first flight. That was all down to airmanship. Why he didn't get differences training on that aircraft, you know, goodness only knows, but that's the result. And the thing is, you know, you can imagine, he's probably just destroyed $100,000 of aircraft and risked his own health and safety for the fact for, for the alternative, you know, the opportunity cost there was literally, you know, 300, 400 bucks with an instructor and he'd have learned everything he needed to know. Anyway, hey there. So now we come to the bit. I've managed to overrun a wee bit. But now we're going to the meat, the meat and potatoes of what we're all about. And that's techniques. And sadly, and I say the word sadly, because I think it fits perfectly. We, at 2020, have gone through a real rocky, confused, muddled, call it what you will, can't find enough adjectives to describe the mess that is what we are doing with takeoff techniques. It is no wonder that people have problems with takeoffs. Now, I don't know particularly what is the common takeoff technique that you employ in the US. But I think it's probably similar to that in the UK.
but I'll reflect what I know of the UK scene, and I think some of it is migrating to the US. So, in the early days, all takeoffs in gyroplanes were done what, by what is commonly referred to as a wheel balance technique. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that when you start the ground roll, you've got the stick all the way back in your chest and you're accelerating down the runway with the stick all the way back and you're trying to establish the aircraft in this wheel balanced attitude and that will come once the rotors have got up to somewhere near flying speed. Once you've got to that attitude, you would then, if you haven't already got full power established, you would then add full power and you would fly it off the runway. So you'd be unstuck, but not climbing out. You'd hold the wheel, you'd hold the airspeed buildup attitude and you would, you would climb away. And the profile, if I just go back to this, profile would look very similar to this. The only difference between what I've tried to express here, and I'll, we'll come on to it in a later slide, and that wheel balance is the fact that here, we're talking about a quantified distance to clear 50 feet, which realistically, in single seat terms, is probably not necessarily, wasn't the biggest focus, simply because, as I'd explained before, the process to get to that point where you can unstick was less consistent uh, than it is today. So, I said it was muddled, and in the preview film where I was trying to encourage people to come and join us on this seminar, <clears throat> I said that there was a dangerous amount of deception from instructors. And I'll qualify that with this slide. This slide isn't one graphic, it's actually a montage of techniques that have exist, been, ex, been in existence and articulated since 2008. So we're not talking about since the invention of the sport gyrocopter in 1955. We're talking about modifications since 2008. And this is only slide one. I've got another slide. So let's go through them. This panel on the left is actually an extract, <clears throat> an actual extract from the AIB accident that happened to an MT-03 that crashed into the boundary fence uh, on an island in the UK. And conveniently, the AIB recorded this bit of data because it reflects what a guy called Phil Harwood wrote about in his first book, in 2008. And that technique there that I've just described <clears throat> about wheel balance is broadly what Harwood talks about in this 2008 book. I would say that he also highlights the building of the airspeed to 70 miles an hour during the airspeed build up phase. I caution that these days because in order to accelerate from 60 miles an hour to 70 miles an hour, if your motivation is to clear a 50 foot obstacle as quickly as possible, 70 miles an hour is too fast. 70 miles an hour is not the speed that would be referenced in any autogyro or any Magni POH. So if you're using this technique, that's the built-in snag I've told you about it, don't let it be you. If we move over to the top right, we've now got this little panel. That is an extract from the UK syllabus for what a takeoff is supposed to be. Again, very similar to um, the wheel balance process. Now the reason that I highlight these two things in addition is because 
the UK syllabus has existed <coughs> since 2009. So when Harwood wrote this in 2008, and Harwood was also part of the working group that produced this in 2009, this has also been revised in 2014 and remained unchanged, as in the syllabus itself was looked at as early as 2014, but this part remained unchanged. However, in 2012, the same working group here produced this for the CAA. And I rem if you remember, I, I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to go back to this or I'm going to go to this. This is a CAA safety sense leaflet that was produced in 2012. You can see at the bottom, August uh, 2012. And one of the things that was happening is we had a very warm summer and some aircraft ended up in the boundary fence and the CAA said, crikey, what's going on here? We should tell people to stop doing that because I think, it, I think at one point, almost 20% of the Auto Gyro UK fleet had crashed on takeoff, same thing. So they then came up with a differentiator to talk about performance takeoffs and rough ground takeoffs. And this is where the focus from the CAA was on the ability to clear 50 feet where it wasn't before. However, if I go back to my slide, I'll show you the obvious error. And that is, here look, you've got a performance takeoff, which if we'd have gone back to the CAA safety leaflet, was the distance required to clear 50 feet. But if we look at what's been described in this 2008 book, a performance takeoff used to achieve the shortest possible ground run, which is basically what's then described as a rough ground takeoff. Now, it's not surprising, therefore, that there's been confusion and misdirected focus around takeoffs amongst people who fly gyroplanes. And it gets even better because this little panel here and this text is an extract from another book that was written in 2017, where now we've introduced a concept of power to initial. And the reason for that is because people were struggling with finding the wheel balance. So they found an easy way to get people to get that wheel balance attitude in a more manageable way. And they've got this concept of lift power, which is something less than 100% power. It's something I complained about in 2017 when this came out, because for the reasons I've said about performance, because that absolutely will not get you to clear 50 feet quickly. And now this is an extract someone sent me from uh, the, the, the commonly used website, or certainly in the UK, it's relatively common, this IAPGT. And this is the process just for building rotor speed alone. I mean, and this has got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. It's got 18 steps. 18 steps, and we've literally just got going. Now, I don't think when you reflect on those situations, i.e., the fact that we've had a confusion around what a performance takeoff is, a confusion around what technique we're using, an addition of terms that were absolutely going to degrade the ability to clear 50 feet and now a more an ever complex process which has now evolved actually also in this we've now got the fact that we're supposed to not just set this power but we're supposed to 
vocalize that and verbalize the number and fly to that number. And then on top of all of that, we're now monitoring. I mean, I have to applaud this in some ways, but at least now we're monitoring rotor RPM. But the mental soak of people's capacity is just incredible. So what do I suggest? Well, first of all, I think it would be a good idea if we pegged our takeoffs to two types. Either we're going to be motivated to clear 50 feet, and we'll call that, for want of a better word, a performance takeoff, or we'll call it a rough ground takeoff. And what that is, is as you can see depicted in this graphic, we just want to get unstuck sooner rather than later. We might be motivated to do that if we're operating off a bumpy, rough uh, airfield and we don't want to either abuse the landing gear or maybe it's just dirty and rocky or stony and we don't want to pull a lot of rubbish through the prop and onto the tailplane or risk a puncture or maybe there's some holes or rocks, some kind of issue. But my, but my um, caution around the latter, this rough ground takeoff, is twofold. The first is, unless you're an experienced pilot, I don't really think you've got much business operating off such ropey old airfields because for all other reasons, you, you know, rocks, stones, debris, whatever, that in itself is a hazard. The other problem is, is that that technique is going to increase the takeoff distance required. And it's going to increase it to an unknown by an unknown amount. And I say it's an unknown amount because depending on how well you execute this, and typically if you're a new pilot, you won't execute it very well at all because it requires you to hold the nose very high quite early and drive it off with quite a high power set. And in fact, if you're taught this technique, you've probably pre-rotated to as high a value as possible and then gone to 100% power immediately from brake release, the nose is going to come up quite aggressively. And I don't think that's a very... Look, if you have to do it as part of your training process, so be it. But having done it once or twice on a pilot course and then not done it again until you get to some ropey old field 12 months later, I think we can see what the consequences or the likelihood of you getting that right are, and I think they're fairly slim. So let's stick with the top one, which is we want to be motivated to clear 50 feet. So how can we do that? Well, you've got really two options, in my opinion. You've got the old version, which is do wheel balancing and then drive it off having first wheel balance. Or you could do the technique that I've talked about a lot on my channel, which is where once you've started the ground roll and you can see the rotor RPM typically getting up to around 250, you can start unloading the stick about a fist, a fist and a half and get to full power then. And that will improve takeoff performance. I won't show the video here just because I'm an hour and a half in and I've got some more things I'd like to talk about. But if you want clarity on that technique, just watch, I think it's called Take Off Performance Compared. It's on my instructional um, playlist. And that tells you all you need to know about that technique. I can tell you that if you're, in, if you're a pilot in training, that technique will go down like a lead balloon because the traditional instructors don't like it. Why don't they like it? Well, they don't like it because it performs, it basically don't like it because it outperforms their normal takeoff. And they feel suddenly that the aircraft is getting airborne quickly. And they don't like that. Go, go, go figure. So, the other technique that you've got to be aware of is the fact that it's not just for Cavalon 915, 
uh, I've just used that as an indicative picture. It actually applies to all auto gyros with something that they call rotor head three. Rotor head three is the mechanism that allows pre-rotation up to 320 rotor RPM. Now I want to show you a video as to why, well, I'm showing you a video of a real snag that someone's got themselves into. They don't crash. Actually, they perform not a bad takeoff, really. But I want to show you why this is something that you need to be aware of if you fly this kind of aircraft. Because although this is a 915 Cavalon picture, and actually the aircraft that's in the video is a 915 Cavalon, if you rotor head three exists on 912 aircraft, 912 Sport and uh, 912 Calidus and 912 Cavalon. And if you do what happens in this video, but with a lower spec motor, then not only do you degrade the takeoff performance, as in you could have got better, but you degrade it more than you would have achieved a takeoff had you just done a 200 rotor RPM pre-rotation. So let me tee up this video and I'll show you what happens. So let's just get this up. Bear with me. So. Sorry for the delay. It's, it's here. Here we go. So let me just get this back to that here. I'm afraid to say that the video has got a whole bunch, it's got a little bit of music attached to it. And if you relate this video, so I'll stop waffling and I'll get on with it now that I've found the clip. So this pilot, I don't know him, is, is actually some connection to the New York auto gyro dealer i don't know whether he owns that business whether he's their flight instructor or their salesman whatever he doesn't fly too badly in fairness and he sounds a reasonably articulate guy he's all being trained via this iapgt method because what you're about to hear are the steps for takeoff as reflected in that little slide that we had before except that the process is wrong for what he's doing because he's pre-rotating to 300 rotor RPM. And I highlight it and I'll play the clip now and I'll highlight it for reasons that I'll describe after we've listened to this. So we don't keep that engine from bogging. 120 is thick forward and straight. Feeling smooth. All gauges are nominal. 200, that's enough for us to fly, but we're going to go for a little bit more of a performance take off here. 260, 270, 280, 90, one release pre right there, two stick pull out three. Release wheel brake, four power initial. No, we can pop, I'm going to go for full power. So, you can see that I'm just going to go back to me. And then I'm going back to our presentation. So you can see that he's basically parrot fashion. He's gone through, let's just get this here. He's basically gone one release spree rotator, two the stick comes back, three power, uh, release the wheel brake, then he said power to initial. Now the problem is, He's learned that off by heart and he's managed to regurgitate it faithfully on camera. But the problem is, if you go to the Cavalon POH and look at takeoff process 
uh, there we go. Calvalon POH short field takeoff, which is what he was trying to describe as a performance takeoff. Actually, you don't move the stick all the way back for that kind of takeoff. What you actually do is with the stick moved slightly aft. So it isn't even you go all the way back and then unload the stick. You just don't move it all the way back in the first place. And as I said to you before I played the clip, it's fine because he had a 915 Cavalon and he was on a tarmac runway and it made no difference to his life other than, you know, maybe it cost him a few meters on the runway. But the reality is, had he been flying a 912 powered aircraft and he pre rotated to those values and then pulled the stick all the way back. The rotor drag is so enormous, it almost acts on a massive parachute and you just don't accelerate. A 912 can barely get the thing going. I remember I did this, I, the reason I know is because I did it myself. I just kind of defaulted into a standard takeoff and I almost used the kilometer of runway to get myself and a 70 kilo passenger uh, off the deck. And it wasn't a particularly hot day or challenging day. It took forever. And uh, you look into it and, and there again is another, another snag. So can you imagine, you go into that process and now you've got power to initial and full power during the takeoff roll is now, uh, there's optionality around that. You can see that there's all manner of potential snags that these people, by just repeating things without really understanding why or, or what they're doing, are, are going to fall into. So, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, blade sailing, because I know a lot of people are nervous around this, but I wanted to highlight something. This is an extract from a Cavalon POH. It didn't have to be a Cavalon, could have been any auto gyro, but it says, look here, you can fly these aircraft with a maximum wind speed of 40 knots. Now, if you line up on the runway and pre-rotate 200 and you're in a 40 knot wind, it means that the tip speed of the rotors are 200 miles an hour and the airspeed is 46 miles an hour. That gives a tip speed ratio, i.e. the ratio of airspeed on the nose to rotor speed at the tip of spot two, three. If you extrapolate that, it means that you could allow the rotor RPMs to decay to about 180 and even then have an airspeed on the nose of 36. Now, Obviously, if you pull the stick all the way back in a 40 knot headwind, as soon as you bring the stick back, you're going to accelerate the rotors anyway. So that 36 miles an hour, I just mention it because even in a flat, calm day, if you're pre-rotating relatively accurately to 200 or 220, and then allow the rotors to decay to 180, you could still accelerate the aircraft to around 36, and you would not sail the blades. You would not have a problem because we know that the aircraft can, by just its normal operating window, would allow those values. It also means that once you accelerated the rotors to around 250, you could also see uh, airspeed of around 58. And I highlight that because Going back to my earlier point around monitoring rotor RPMs, if you monitor rotor RPMs, you're very unlikely to ever, ever have a problem sailing the rotor blades, but you do need to monitor them. And the final point for me, which kind of we've already covered to some degree, is around mental capacity and checklists. Mental capacity is obviously a very big uh, issue 
with new qualified pilots or students because there's a lot going on and there's especially a lot going on around the takeoff phase. It's a high stress environment anyway, but when you're doing takeoffs, you've probably just done some pre takeoff checks. You've probably uh, been on the radio and have been either asked to do something or asked to repeat something back. And there's probably other traffic either on approach or already waiting at the hold and you're in a queue and there's an element of perhaps being self-conscious and so on and so forth. And all of these things can combine to mean that you're already kind of maxed out. So I mentioned that and, and I don't mean to beat up on this particular process that we see here, but you do have to call it as you see it. And when you've got something which has got 18 steps, you've either got to take some of those steps out or you've got to question whether they're really necessary and part of this process. Because if you try as a student to remember those 18 steps, I can tell you you're going to fail. Why do I know that you're going to fail? Well, as it happens, I've got a report on something that I'm about to pull up here. This is called, that's right, I was going to pull it up, but I copped it all up. There you go. Checklist by EASA. For those of you who don't know, EASA is just the European version of the FAA or the CAA. And this is a whole piece of research that they've done on checklists. Now, you can find that from Google. <clears throat> I'll send people a link. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But basically what they say is, once a checklist gets above around five items, it's not possible, or, it's, or your ability to remember, or your likelihood of successfully remembering it repeatedly is degraded. Now bear in mind, all of this, if I stop that and go back to PowerPoint takeoff, we're talking about the takeoff here. Cannot get the checklist out as you would do when you're on the apron doing your check A or, you know, before engine starting kind of thing. This has got to be in the head. And bear in mind, you know, there's a lot of airmanship things that you've got to remember anyway, like where am I going and who am I talking to and what runway and what taxiway and what hold point and what about the engine uh, power checks and so on and so forth. You get to line up on the runway and literally you don't know what way is the right way up. And, and it's for those reasons that if you are using this methodology, or your instructors using this methodology, I think you need to have a conversation and just find out a way that he'd be happy of what you could get rid of. For me, what I would do is I would amalgamate some of these items. So for example, where you get the release pre-rotator and pull the stick back as two items, I just pull the stick back. Because the consequence of not releasing the pre-rotator, A, if you're in auto gyro, they've got a micro switch which, makes, which releases it anyway, so it's of no consequence whatsoever. And if you're in a Magni, for example, the stick's already fully back. So you could probably drop one of those steps in, depending on what aircraft you fly, you know, you drop either number one or number two. Release the wheel brake. I think that's kind of a given, isn't it? I mean, you're not going to start the ground roll unless you've released the wheel brake. And I'm not entirely sure the consequence of not releasing the wheel brake is very much other than you, you just don't go anywhere. So you can probably get rid of that. And then power to initial. Forget this power to initial. That is total nonsense. What you need to do is get the power on 
so that the aircraft moves forward. And that's obviously going to change depending on the wind state, because once you've got that uh, rotor inclined all the way back, it's like a massive parachute, just add power so that you start moving. And that way you shed a whole bunch of steps and you can start remembering some important things rather than as a New York Cavalon pilot, he remembered all the steps and well done to him. It's just the fact that he remembered them, but they were inappropriate for the things that he was doing at the time. So there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, that's me complete. Uh, so if you've got any questions or, or not, then if you haven't, I'll wrap up and I'll have a cup of tea or probably a beer. Ah, Q&A. Here we go. You haven't flown. OK, so I don't know. I'm not sure who can see what here, but Herb's asked, He's not flown a gyrocopter yet. During takeoff, is the nose wheel balance the normal operation or for rough field takeoff? Or why is the nose wheel balance needed for a normal takeoff? Okay, good question. So let me explain what's going on there. And while I do that, if anyone else can think of a question or a follow on, ask now or forever hold your peace. Right, so for Herb's benefit, let's go back to a PowerPoint presentation. So the point of this is, Herb, I'm just trying to find it there. So this is the big one. So back in the day, in fact, if you've got five seconds, I'll give you a little video and you'll see perfectly why the situation occurred. Basically, Herb, wheel balancing all comes from the early days of gyrocopters and single seaters. And in the old days, let me just find, let me just find it here. Hello everybody, welcome to the Gyrocopter Fly Club. This film will be about wheel balance. So, this is a film I've got uh, on the channel. It's about wheel balancing. And I always tend to, I always used to start my films with a military theme, just because I quite like them. But the key part of this is, this is the, this is the origin, this is the origin of uh, gyroplane. So you didn't have a pre-rotator, literally someone just wound the rotors off and off you went. And this was the early way of training. It was called a gyro glider and it would just be towed behind a van or someone's car. And during this training process, you would build rotor speed and you just kind of practice in this low level state. And of course, in those days, you may not have even had a uh, rotor. I'm just going to stop that and I'm come back to me and then back to the PowerPoint presentation. In those early days, they may not have even had a rotor attack, a rotor RPM gauge. So, but of course, because they're all single seaters, you've got to remember, if you're in the aircraft the first time you ever fly it is you're on your top, you're on your own. Obviously, people, the instructor community and you yourself were motivated not to get airborne because clearly, if you got airborne, even beyond 50 feet, and it's your very first time in the aircraft, you were probably going to end your days right there. However, with two-seat aircraft, I'm the instructor in the back of the aircraft and you're flying for the very first time. I don't care if you get to 50 feet, 150 feet, or 5,050 feet, because at some point, if you've had enough, I can just say, I have control, and I'll fly the aircraft, and you can have a rest, or think about something, technique, whatever. So, 
wheel balancing, the legacy of that is, or the origin of that is in single seaters. It's not necessarily appropriate for today, in my opinion, but there's a huge legacy around it because most of the instructors, as I explained back here, follow that process. And because this community, and just to expand on my views, this community is quite small. And like any small community, there's always a tendency for people not to speak out about things because everybody likes to get along with each other because they then get along. And if you're the outlier and you stick your hand up and say, hang on a minute, why are we doing this? You know, for example, if I speak to Phil Harwood and say, hang on a minute, why have you called it a performance takeoff over here saying it's the shortest possible ground run? And then literally, a few years later, you call it something else, but then what's that all about? You know, how did that happen? How, when did you suddenly decide that one wasn't valid anymore and the new thing is? I don't know. I mean, you'll have to ask him. But to answer your question, absolutely, wheel balancing can be used for this performance takeoff. You can use that technique uh, for clearing 50 feet but you've got to be cognizant of the fact that depending on how good you are at finding that nose attitude and how quickly you can get there depends how close you're going to get to the numbers in the pilot operating handle so for example if i go back to my pilot operating handbook here let me just go back here just to explain it <clears throat> absolutely if you happen to be flying a Cavalon, for example, uh, at some point, you, you're going to be asked by your instructor or by your examiner, if you're flying this Cavalon, <clears throat> how much distance do I need to clear 50 feet? And you're going to use this document and it's going to say, oh, here we go, take off and landing data takeoff distance where it depends whether you've got HTC prop which is basically a, fi a fixed pitch prop or a wood comp prop which is an adjustable prop <clears throat> and, it, and you either need 300 meters or 260 meters if you're at 560 kilos and you've pre-rotated to 300 and you've used the correct technique obviously if you're no good at wheel balancing or you use power to initial and then lift power you know how long is a piece of string it could be 5300 meters i don't know and and that's and that's the you know that's the problem that's absolutely the problem the rough field realistically what you've probably got to accept is that if you use the wheel balance technique really it's more likely to be erring towards the rough ground technique than it is a performance takeoff uh, technique. So I'll look at, Ken's asked me a question. If that hasn't answered your question, Herb, follow up again. Otherwise I'll assume that you're happy. So Ken asks me, you mentioned pilot weight as a factor. Say you have two passengers of maybe 275 pounds, what currently is the most powerful gyrocopter that might be able to carry that load? Or is that too much weight for today's gyrocopters? Okay, <clears throat> well, so I'm assuming that these two passengers are not two passengers concurrently, i.e. you're the pilot and you're taking two additional people. Because most gyroplanes that I well, all the gyroplanes in the UK uh, are going to be limited to two seats. If I get my, I just need a little calculator actually, Herb, because I know you guys used to be part of the empire, but we've moved on from pounds now. It's like we're, we're, we're all European over here. 125 kilos. So, if you've got two people in the aircraft at 125 kilos, 
um, you're going to be at the limit in the sense that you will be able to fly to uh, no actually it depends in actual fact because some of the new aircraft have got a seat limit and uh, let's have a look at this Cavalon. It's touch and go actually, uh, Ken. Let me just, sorry, I know this is a bit of a faff. Let me just try and find here where the limitations are. Uh, here you go, limitations 2.1. We'll answer the question. We'll discover the answer together. But you see, these things are kind of, and, and I, well, I'll, I'll go off on another another little rant, not that I really need very much excuse, but this is the other thing. You know, the sales process for these aircraft is atrocious. There's very little handover. There's very little in the way of sitting down and explaining all these things. Here you go, weight and balance, weight limits, here you go. So look, so a Cavalon, this is a 915 uh, POH, don't forget. So Cavalon 915 has got a 560 kilo maximum all up weight. So minus your 250 kilos for the two people, these 310. Now most, I don't know, but the last Cavalon 915 I flew, I actually did a review on the channel and I do talk about the weight. Off my head, I think it was 323 kilos. So, but that had quite a big spec. It had leather seats and, uh, no, it didn't have leather seats. It had a, the thing that added the weight to that aircraft, it had a variable pitch prop. It had a hydraulically adjustable prop. And that added a bunch of weight. So with your theoretical 225 kilo people, you couldn't fly that aircraft because you wouldn't be able to put any fuel in it. But the problem is here, look, also, the maximum seat weight here, look, left hand and right hand seat is 110 kilos. So 110 kilos uh, in old fashioned money is 242 pounds. So that's the seat limit in a 915 Cavalon. I don't actually think it's, I think all of the new, so I think for example, the new uh, MTO Sport, has got the same seat limit actually. Now I, now I think about it. So the answer to the question is, forget the combined weight, uh, even if you had one person that was that, that weight, you, you couldn't fly a new autogyro. I don't know, I don't believe Magni will give you any better seat weight range what things like things that so you guys in the states can fly things that we can't fly over in the uk like the the air gyro i don't know whether that would be more helpful from a weight point of view um ela american ranger may help i don't know but i've got to be honest what the thing is if you're 275 pounds on your bathroom scales, when you put, you know, a couple of kilos of clothes, a headset, you put some fuel in it, and maybe a bag, you know, just to carry your wallet and charts and everything. It's amazing how much tat you carry around in these aircraft. You're gonna be at the margin, so you just gotta be aware. You need to do some you need to do some investigating, I think, Ken. Uh, okay, any more for any more? Right, no, that, you're welcome, Ken. And uh, look, obviously it goes without saying for you and for anybody else uh, watching this, if there are questions like that, that come after we've all gone uh, home to our beds or whatever, or on another day, just send me an email or contact me through the YouTube channel and I'd always be, sorry, I'll come back to me. I'm always very happy to help you as far as I can. I know that otherwise you're left all at sea and there's no point 
buying an aircraft that you can't that you can't fly. The other thing you need to be aware of is that, of course, you know, depending on how heavy you are as an individual, also means who you can fly what with as an instructor. And I want to leave you actually, just because <laughs> I want to leave you with something that was that made me laugh. And because you guys are in the States, you guys may uh, end up flying with this guy. But if you do, he's just literally the most chaotic guy I've ever heard do any flight instruction. It's just unbelievable the way the way he articulates himself to the instructor, uh, to, to his student. Let me just, let me stop wittering again. And uh, well, where am I? I've lost all of this stuff here. Hang on. Let's try and find my Zoom screen. There you go, back to this. All right, here we go. You, you'll, you'll enjoy this. So I'm gonna go quiet. And put the mute and put the noise on for this guy, but this just sounds like you're literally seconds from disaster. Okay, take back, take back, power. Okay, get ready, get ready, get ready to push forward. Okay, hold it right, hold it right there. Get the nose down, get the nose down. Boom, boom. Hold the nose down. Keep her straight now, or get it ground effect. Keep her straight. Right water, right water, right water, right water. <laughs> okay, right, fine, right, fine. Oh, that's awesome. So you can see that, you can see that that, <laughs> that instructor just sounded as if he was probably what one hour ahead of the student there in terms of what he knew. I, I, I just thought it was quite, quite comical. But that's auto gyro. That's auto gyro in Louisiana. So if you're in Louisiana and you have to go for flight instruction, you're going to have to put up with that guy telling you right rudder. Mind you, I guess at some point you don't forget to put the right rudder in. Bob's asking me, do I expect any unification of the various bodies in instruction or has there been resistance? Um, it's a good question. Uh, honestly, no. So basically, this is what I know, or this is my, this is my view on gyroplane instruction. So in the old days, back uh, when there was single seater, or there was a good single seater and uh, kit built bunch of aircraft. In the US, you had the PRA, the Popular Rotorcraft Association. And in the UK, we had the British Rotorcraft Association, the BRA. Uh, they've both been, they're both shadows of their former self. And I say that without being mean but it's a combination of two things one is just the change in society and culture where because we can all do this and look i'm in the uk near uh i'm about an hour north of london and you guys are all scattered around the world this session is typically a us focused session but you know we're all everywhere uh, we don't go to a pub anymore and drink beer and talk about our projects and gain, you know, little tidbits of information. There's very few published newsletters anymore because that's expensive and we can do it online and all that kind of good stuff's gone. So the big, and I, and I hate, I hate to keep saying the guy's name because it sounds as if I'm running him over all the time. And I'm not, it's just because he's fundamentally he's created you know, he's put himself in the position. But this guy, Phil Harwood, you know, fundamentally, if you, if you read a book about gyroplanes um, in 2020, it's probably something that he's written. Um, and if you look at all of the training material, most of it's his. And I know that he is trying to gain some traction in the US because... Um, well, first of all, it's a new market for him, so he can make some money, and there's nothing wrong with having a commercial angle. Uh, I know he did a seminar live 
I think he was in Arizona, wasn't he, over the winter? Um, I guess he would have gone to places like Sun and Fun and Oshkosh this year, but for the virus. And he's trying to develop that market. Um, he's also trying to work with insurance companies, because I think in the States, your insurance is pretty expensive. And he's trying to do something where if he follows course, that allows you to have some discount on insurance. I actually don't think it will gain a lot of traction. And as I've already articulated, I don't actually agree with very much of, of what's happening. What I do think is whether there's any official uh, unification or, or not, my own view is if you're a new pilot, uh, i.e. you don't fly an aeroplane or a helicopter already, I think you need probably, you probably need to do at least, I mean, and when I say at least, the bottom end of this is that you're a really good stick and, you know, you've got really good stick and rudder skills and you put in a lot of work to, to, to pay attention to all that um, airmanship stuff that I alluded to. I reckon that you need at least 40 to 50 hours. And if you're not really that motivated, and when I say motivated, some of the students I've had definitely, they, what they do is they arrive at the airfield to do their flying lesson. And that's the first time really they've thought about flying or what they're going to do with the lesson since the last time you saw them. And that in the, in the early lessons, you can get away with that because you know, you, you are being spoon fed and everything's new and there's no expectation from the instructor. But eventually you, that costs you because the, stu the, the instructor doesn't want to spoon feed forever because at some point you're going to go solo and you can't be spoon fed. So, you know, you're going to have to look after yourself. So I'd say 50 hours is a new, a new guy at least. And if you're transitioning pilot from fixed wing or helicopters, you know, you're going to need just to get through the sheer weight of things to do, like takeoffs, landings, emergencies. If you're going to do them properly, you probably do need 15 hours, actually. You know, I don't, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of fat in it when you're down to, and when I say 15 hours, I mean, you know, 15 hours of dual instruction. I don't know. Depends where you are. Depends how much uh, solo time you need. But but there's quite a lot to get through. And and as you can see, the takeoff part of the the the, the gyroplane process is is quite involved. There's a lot to get done. And if you're not on your game, you you drop the ball. And people do. That's why. That's why all these accidents, or the vast majority, are in the takeoff and landing phase. I think in Europe they're trying to get a they're trying to get an EASA uh, gyroplane license, but I think that will fail. And the reason I think it will fail, the motivation for the EASA gyroplane license is the uh, PAL V project, the the, the 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 concept of a flying car. And um, the reason that they need an EASA's uh, license for that to work is because all of the licenses for gyroplanes in Europe at the moment are national licenses. So, of course, if you drive your flying car into um, Belgium and then you want to fly it, well, then you need a Belgian gyroplane license and so on. So, that there's the motivation. But the problem is, as soon as you go to EASA, the, the, the raw material that they're going to work with is whose? Are they going to work with this IAPGT? Well, I can tell you, if they do, there's ain't a hope in hell that anybody that looks at this with fresh eyes from a regulator point of view is going to allow things where people are encouraged to get airborne on part throttle because if you do at some point what's going to happen and i and i see this as a big danger in the us 
someone's going to get airborne, they're going to crash, and then they're going to say, well, hang on a minute, I wasn't ever told that I needed to go to full power to get airborne. And of course, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out that if you're in a litigious society and that happens, someone's going to get, you know, whether, and probably the poor old instructor who just didn't, didn't take heed. So that's my view. Keith is training with that IAPGT, I'll get it's a tongue twister, IAPGT syllabus. Thankfully, my instructor has abandoned. What does he teach then, Keith? That, that I'm interested because I have to be honest. So just to give you some color as to my own preference. One of the problems, of course, is that at some point, the student ends up with an examiner. And in some ways, some of what you, or at least part of what you teach, is in deference to what the examiner is going to want to see. And most examiners, certainly in the UK, want to see a wheel balance, or they want to see an attempt. Uh, I had a, a student before the lockdown, actually it was before, the, before Christmas last year, who went to take his test with an examiner. And, and there was no problem, but it was commented upon that he got airborne quickly. And I actually said to the examiner, well, talk me through the problem there. I don't get it. I said, was it out of control? Oh, no, 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 but he just got airborne quickly. And I, and I just didn't, I didn't get his point. And of course, at some point, you just don't pursue it because what, <laughs> what you don't want is your student to have passed his flying test and then you kibosh it because you just ended up in an argument with the examiner. But, but what do you mean there, Keith, with his abandonment? What, what does he teach you? I mean, do you mind me asking where, who, what, why, or is that sensitive? Just put put it in, put it here if you can. Just I'm just interested. In the meantime, while you maybe give me some colour there, uh, I'm assuming we've got no more Q and A. Is there anything that you would like me? Well, first of all, I hope you enjoyed, uh, and I hope it was useful to some degree. Uh, is there any topics that you'd like me to cover in the future? Or you don't care, or you do care, but you've all not thought, or no, okay. So, there you go. Uh, Keith's telling me about his wheel balance. So we now no longer bring the stick fully back. And for, okay, well that's interesting. Who is that, is that in the, in the UK? And who with? I'm just in, I'm just interested, Keith. Not not to not to make waves. I'm just interested as to what the general the general feeling is really. Because I and this is the other thing. If you go while you're while you're typing while you're typing uh, all that. Ah, uh, Bob, emergency procedures. Ah, oh, hang on. Sorry, I'll cover your things in a minute, Bob. Actually. Um, the reason I was interested in Keith's thing in the chat is because if you go back to, where am I? I've got so many, so many things on the go. Uh, and I think I've closed my presentation down. No, I haven't. There we go. There we go. I'll start whispering and I'll get on with it. Come on, Paul. Get a grip. Get a grip. The, the reason I'm interested in it is because if you go back to, so many things open here. Here we go. If I go back to this, sorry, I just got lost there in all of the different things that I was trying to put up. If you go back to all of these different takeoff techniques and the evolution of all of this, at some point it just gets quite ridiculous if they're constantly, I mean, I'm not part of that gang um, because I just had enough of the, of frankly, the, the, the nonsense actually. And 
And at some point, what, what's going to happen if you've got an 18 step process that's constantly evolving? At what point do you call time and say, actually, that's enough? You know, we've got to, we've got to firm up on this and this actually, this actually what we, uh, um, you know, actually what we've got to suck up and say. Uh, Bill's asking me what my takeoff technique is. So, <clears throat> well, it's kind of a grandiose way of saying it, actually. I, I mean, I call it my technique, uh, Bill, just as a differentiator from other methodologies, basically. But the reality is, Bill, is that if you, because we're getting late and I want to get back to Bob's thing, um, if you go to my channel, and in the channel, search under playlists, instruction, and you'll, fi you'll find a picture. It's actually an extract from a comedy series that, that was popular in, in, in England called Black Adder. And in this Black Adder episode, uh, it's based, it, it was a funny episode where it was a lad's night out in medieval times, and they go for a beer and they've got comedy breasts. Only the lord of this comedy show had got a pair of golden comedy breasts. So you'll see a picture. It looks a bit odd, but it's basically a pair of normal breasts and these golden breasts. And it's called Take Off Performance Compared. And that explains the difference in the technique. Broad, broadly speaking, the main difference is a focus upon two things. Uh, one is... Once you brought, you do bring the stick all the way back initially, but you unload the stick slightly, and it is ever so slightly. I mean, it's it, look, my, I mean, it depends how big your fists are, but let me just there. My fist is relatively, I suppose, it's a bit small, but you know, I'm a I'm five foot eight, five foot nine, uh, 80 kilo guy, so what's that, 190 pounds, and um. Once you start the ground roll and you can see the rotor RPM increasing, you unload the stick a little bit. Why do you do that? Well, because it makes a lot less drag from the rotor. And in the end, uh, the combination of airspeed on the nose and rotor speed uh, gets you airborne to clear 50 feet a lot faster than if you persist with a wheel balance. And the problem is if you persist with a wheel balance, going back to the, the, the seminar, you end up with this nodding effect where you're trying to hold a wheel balance and then you know the nose drops back and so on but take a take a look there and you'll and that'll show you any issues and come back to me on an email or on the channel is that right with kevin what now that that's interesting actually that is very interesting and I'll tell you why it's interesting is because, well, it's interesting because Kevin Whitehead is reasonably well aligned with uh, Harwood, actually. And I'm surprised he's departed so confidently away from the standard. Very interesting, that is, Keith. Very interesting. But I think, I don't know Kevin very well, actually. I think he's a good guy. He's certainly a very nice guy. I haven't spent a lot of time in his company, but what little bits I know about him, he seems a really nice guy. So I think you'll, he'll look after you. The only downside, of course, is you're in Scotland. And if you don't get it done soon, the weather will turn and then it will be 2021. Right, back to Bob. Surely the CA and FA will start taking note of these anomalies. No, Bob, they won't. I'm afraid I've got nothing but... I'm going to say it, actually, because I just can't. I'm too old. I'm 48 and I've been around the block too many times to care. Uh, they just don't care. Yeah, he's a good guy, Paul. Yeah, yeah he's a good guy. Uh, they don't care. The CAA, I've got to say, the CAA, in my experience, are absolutely useless. The problem is, for gyroplanes, it's just not important enough. 
it doesn't generate enough revenue. There's not enough people engaged. And as a result, it's just a backwater. And at the CAA, they've given it to a guy called um, Richard Krask is his name. And Richard Krask's principal job at the CAA is uh, helicopters. And in the end, he's just more of a, and he's a helicopter guy. He doesn't even, he doesn't fly gyroplanes. So what he does, he just basically, the reality is he just defers everything to someone like Harwood because Harwood in the main has got probably 70% of the UK instructors. And the situation as it is just carries on. And, you know, Krask's never going to get sacked from his CAA job because it's a government post. So he's just going to sit in that position, earn his pension, retire and palm it off. In fact, to be honest with you, when he got involved, uh, that was the death of the BRA. The changes that were made between him and others just killed the BRA. The big uh, motivation was things like night rating and commercial rating in England. And I can tell you that <laughs> I don't actually think anybody has ever trained in the th almost three years, I think, you've been able to get a night rating and a commercial rating in the UK. And I don't think anybody's, anyone's got the rating. So that was a whole bunch of effort well used. And what they could have done, in my opinion, instead of spending their time swanning around making a commercial rating and a night rating that nobody's interested in, they could have focused on these fundamentals that we've, you know, part of which we've talked about tonight. But, and the, and the more frustrating thing for me, I have absolutely tried my hardest to engage. You know, I sent them papers, critique, uh, offered to help, and they're not interested. And they're not interested because it requires an output. You know, as soon as you accept that there's something to be done, someone then has to do it. And, and they don't want to do it. You know, Harwood's only interested if he can earn some money out of it. And Krask at the CAA is only interested in helicopters, really, and seeing his time out at the CAA and earn a few quid. And you can imagine now, after the coronavirus, where airlines are shedding staff left, right and centre, that, you know, some people are just wanting to, you know, keep quiet and keep their jobs for another year and, and, and carry on. Uh, emergency procedures, okay, I can do something around that. Although, I have to say though, Bob, emergency procedures, unfortunately, in the main, is a little bit driven by the aircraft POH, in the sense that, what I mean to say is, you can obviously have some generic reactions to things like, you know, look, at the end of the day, some things are gonna require a land immediately, uh, rather than, you know, land at your destination and don't take off until it's been fixed. But really, you, you're as well just going to the POH, and that's the emergency procedure. I would say, uh, and this is again crazy, the guy who's the chief instructor for Autogyro US, Bob Schneider, uh, he's an idiot. Because when Chris Lord got killed uh, in Sebring and the NTSB interviewed him, he said that he thought that the aircraft would have been flyable with the stick disconnected on the trim system alone. Well, I mean, that's what the POH says, suggests that you might be able to do that. But I would pay, I'd bet my, I'd bet my house that Bob Schneider cannot fly one circuit in a Cavalon with the stick disconnected on the trim system alone. He'd kill himself. You know, he'd kill himself, he'd kill himself in the, in the climate. There's just no way you can do that. So again, you know, again, you've got to be, you just got to temper 
some of these idiots that you find in the gyroplane community and they are they are fundamentally they're just irresponsible uh, and it and it makes me angry and it's why the gyrocopter flying club channel exists is to call these people out and you'll notice by the way what you will notice or you may notice if you care there's no one ever from all the criticism and i'm completely open with it there's no one comes back and gives me and puts me and puts me right you know they don't say oh you've been saying that this technique isn't very good and but actually what you've missed is x y and z there's no intelligent dialogue there's literally there's just nothing and it's interesting that what keith says that kevin whitehead in perth is now doing the technique that uh that I've been suggesting that for three years, by the way, since 2017, that's when I suggest that. Hey ho, anyway, guys, in the UK, it's half past 10, and if you're all done, can't believe that we've managed to keep it going for what, was it, two and a half hours. Thanks, Herb, I appreciate that. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Ah, oh, hang on. Sorry, I missed Bob. Bob, it fell off the thing here. Just quickly, Bob say, I wonder if all Harwood's instructors are online. Well, yeah, that's the thing. And, and, and I, <laughs> I, I don't think they are. What, what, what people say to his face and what people say to each other, I, I know it's two different things, but hey-ho. That's just the politics of the small community. Well, the thing is, actually, just to be, just to clear, just to finish on this actually, because it'd be nice to finish on a, on a positive. For all the fact that I've used him as a, a bit of a, you know, he's been a bit of a whipping boy, hasn't he, tonight? And, and I don't mean that, but it's just the fact that it's just, his material's documented and there is so much that I, yeah, I can find little, little snags in. He's actually not a bad guy. If you met him, you'd probably find him quite personal. Um, the thing about it is, is that for some reason, he gets wedded to things. And one of the problems, and it's typified, I'll just quickly go back to <clears throat> the PowerPoint, actually, real quick. Sorry to take up all your time. The biggest problem with the technique is, where, is how these guys are going to relate to Rotorhead 3 where it clearly says you don't bring the stick back at all. And that is such a departure from this technique that they've described that I don't see how they get that interwoven without getting themselves all in all of a muddle. Because of course it's so different. And of course one of the things that's, one of the things that's important is that you do at some point uh, follow the POH? You know, if you can't, you can't be flying. You, for example, you couldn't put a student forward to an examiner to be tested with an aircraft that was capable of doing something, and you can, especially when it's regarding the ability to match or close or get anywhere near the takeoff performance numbers as per the POH, if you're just physically unable to perform that. I mean, that to me is, would be insa insanity, but there you go. Uh, right, I think we've had, we've had a good chip. We've had a good, we've put the world to rights at the very least. Thank you, everybody. Can't wait for that. Yes, that's exactly. Carlos has hit the, <laughs> Carlos hit the nail on the head. The next one is gonna be on landing because that will neatly tie this up before i go and for my own uh, sake and i guess for yours does anybody have any preference when we do that i'm assuming you're all going to join me again for landings would you like it i could probably maybe do it next week although the only downside actually i'm going to say no the reason is I live in Silverstone Village, which is next door, 
well, I live here because that's what my old job used to be and it was convenient. But I'm right next to the racetrack. And then for the next two weekends, we've got the Formula One at the racetrack. And what will happen is, is the, the sessions will get loud and you can hear the race cars on the track. And the fans, even though they can't have fans here, uh, they'll, be, they'll be on the gas, camping and having a social. So we'll get noisy with fireworks. So yes, I agree, Herb. I'm gonna take a break for a couple of weeks while Formula One's on. And perfect, yeah, yeah, okay. And then, and then we'll get into it. And in the meantime, if you could do me a favor, this would be the, this would be the great favor, and I think it would make for a richer engagement. What I want you to do is for the loyal people that are gonna listen to my nonsense week in, week out, so to speak, why don't I get some feedback? So what I want you to do is two things. Firstly, think about things that you want to know about landings so that when we get to this bit, I can tell you what you want to know. Second thing is, reflect on this session and anything that you don't really understand or would like it explained again, you can ask me that. And the final thing is, for those of you that are engaged with instructors, I want you to ask their opinion of what I'm saying. And I want not, not to cause conflict so I can get on the phone and tell X, Y, Z, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But what I want to know is where there's pushback, if there's valid feedback, it's important for me. I, look, I don't know everything. I'm, you know, I've got 2,000 hours of instruction, which I think gives me some credibility, but I don't know everything. I mean, for example, the guy at uh, Cumbria, Chris Jones, I think he's got 7,000 hours instruction in gyros so and chris i don't necessarily think would agree chris likes the wheel balance technique i think but that's because i think he's back he's got a single seater background but get some feedback more than anything you know you might find that the instructors that you've got have got some questions and maybe i can answer them because i am you know i'm open and available for feedback and critique. The other thing I would say, and I don't mean this to be a sales thing, but I will say it. If you're gonna come and see this kind of thing often, you need to go via the patron website and subscribe at VIP or all access because it will be way better value. You know, I think this was six quid I made a mistake last time, I forgot that I was in the UK, so I had the FX transaction. But anyway, six quid's what, it's about eight bucks. So, you know, if we're gonna do one of these, probably gonna end up, once we get beyond the virus, it'll probably end up being once a month at least. But in the meantime, a couple of months, we've already done two this month. So you may as well go that way, let's keep paying the other way. I'm just saying, I mean, I'm happy to take more money off you, but, but it's probably better the other way. The other thing is, is that the recordings for these, uh, if they sit on the Zoom server, they have to be deleted because it takes up too much space. So what I do is I copy them and download them and they're available via Patreon. And in the long term, will only be available uh, that way. Okay. Guys, thanks for being with me and I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it and I'll see you, I'll see you all in a couple of weeks. It'll be the weekend after Formula One's. I think, I'll just look, sorry, I've got, look, hang on, you'll, you'll like this. This is the kind of man I am, look, there you go. It's vintage tractors all the way for the calendar. I think. I think it'll be week of the 15th or something, probably. Right, guys, stay safe wherever you are, and I'll look forward to seeing you next time.